So this is the law of God, not to be confused with on the law of God, which we just read. So this is the law of God by Father Seraphim Slobodskoy. And this is, we're going to read the first section of this book, which is the, the basic, it's called Basic Concepts, Part 1. And this is Chapter 1, it's called The World. All that we see, heaven, the sun, the moon, stars, clouds, the earth on which we, the earth on which we live, the air we breathe, the earth on which we live, including the grass, trees, mountains, rivers, seas, fish, birds, beasts, animals, and finally people. God created all of this. Yes, indeed, the world is the creation of God. When we see God's world, then we understand how beautifully and wisely it was made. Here we are in a meadow. Overhead, the blue sky with white clouds is stretched out like a tent, and on, and on the earth there is thick green grass sprinkled with flowers. In the grass, we can hear the sounds of various insects, butterflies fluttering around the flowers, and bees and gnats of different kinds flying through the air. The whole earth is like a huge, beautiful carpet. But there is no carpet woven by the hand of man that can be compared with the beauty of God's meadow. Let us take a walk in the woods. There we can see a multitude of different kinds of trees, the mighty oak, the lordly pine, the spotted birch, the fragrant linden, the maple, the tall fir tree, and the thick chestnut tree. There are little clearings with bushes and all kinds of herbs. Everywhere we hear the voices of birds, the buzzing and chirping of insects. Hundreds of different kinds of animals live in the forest. And how many different kinds of berries, mushrooms, and flowers there are. The forest is like a great world unto itself. And here is the river. It quietly flows, sparkling in the sun, sun among the forests, fields, and meadows. How much fun it is to go for a swim. All around it is hot, but in the water it is cool and pleasant. How many different kinds of fish, frogs, water bugs, and other living creatures there are. It has its own life, its own little world. How magnificent the ocean is, with its huge and rich underwater world of living creatures. How beautiful the mountains are, with their lofty peaks covered with eternal snow and ice, high above the clouds. The world is marvellous in its beauty, and all, that it, and all that is in it is full of life. It is impossible to count all the plants and animals that populate the earth, from the very smallest, which are invisible to our eyes, to the very largest. They live everywhere, on the land, in the water, in the air, in the soil, and even deep beneath the earth. It is God who gave all this life to the world. The world of God is rich and varied. At the same time, in all this vast variety, there reigns a marvellous and definite order established by God, or as we often say, the laws of nature. All the plants and animals are distributed throughout the world in, in keeping with this order. What each one is supposed to eat, that is what it eats. And there is a definite and logical purpose given to everything. Everything in the world is born, grows, and dies. One thing is replaced by another. God gave a special time and place and purpose to everything. Man alone lives everywhere on the earth and has dominion over everything. God granted him reason and, a, and an immortal soul. He gave man a special and great purpose, to know God, to be like him, that is, to become constantly better and inherit eternal life. In their external appearance, people are different, but they all have the same reasonable and immortal soul. Through this soul, people are lifted above the animal world and become like God. The world of God is vast, uncontainable. We can neither account for nor measure at all, for only God who created everything knows the measure and weight and number of all things. God created the entire world for the life and benefit of people, for each of us. God's love for us is infinite. If we love God and live according to his law, then much that is unintelligible in the world will become understandable and clear to us. Let us love God's world and live in friendship, love, and joy with everyone. Then this joy will never end, and no one will take it away from us, for God himself will be with us. 
in order to remember that we belong to God, to be closer to him and to live with him, that is to fulfill our purpose on earth and to inherit eternal life, we must know more about God, know his holy will, that is, God's law. Chapter 2, About God God created the whole world out of nothing by his word alone. God can do all that he wishes. God is the highest existence. There is no one nor anything equal to him anywhere, neither on earth nor in heaven. We, mankind, cannot fully comprehend him by our reason. We would know nothing about him unless he himself had not revealed it to us. What we know about God has all been revealed to us by God himself. When God created the first people, Adam and Eve, he appeared to them in paradise, revealing himself to them, revealed how he created the world and how people must believe in the one true God and fulfill his will. This teaching of God was first passed on orally from generation to generation, but later, at the inspiration of God, it was written down by Moses and by the other prophets in the sacred books. Finally, the very Son of God, Jesus Christ, appeared on earth and revealed all that mankind needs to know about God. He revealed to mankind a great mystery. God is one, but a trinity in three persons. The first person is God the Father, the second person is God the Son, the third person is God the Holy Spirit. These are not three gods, but one God in three persons, the trinity in one essence and indivisible. All three persons have the same divine dignity. There is not a senior one among them, nor a junior. As God the Father is true God, so also God the Son is true God, and likewise the Holy Spirit is true God. They are different only in that God the Father is not begotten and does not proceed from anyone. God the Son is begotten of God the Father. The Holy Spirit proceeds from God the Father. Jesus Christ, through the revelation of the mystery of the old Holy Trinity, taught us not only to worship God truly, but also to love God as all three persons of the Most Holy Trinity, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. All eternally abide with, with one another in unceasing love and make up one being. God is all perfect love. The great mystery which God revealed to us concerning himself is the mystery of the Holy Trinity, which our weak mind cannot contain or understand. St. Kirill, the teacher of the Slavs, tried to explain the mystery of the Most Holy Trinity. He said, Do you see in the heavens the brilliant sphere of the sun and how from its light and how from it light is begotten and warmth proceeds? God the Father is like the sphere of the sun without beginning or end. From him is eternally begotten God the Son, like light from the sun. Just as there comes warmth together with light from the sun, the Holy Spirit proceeds. Each one is distinguished separately. The sphere of the sun and the light and the warmth. These are not three suns, but one sun in the heavens. So also in the Holy Trinity. There are three persons, but God is one and indivisible. Blessed Augustine says, you see the Trinity if you see love. This means that we can understand the mystery of the Holy Trinity more readily with the heart that is by love than with our feeble mind. The teaching of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, was written down by his disciple in a sacred book, sorry, by his disciples in a sacred book, which is called the Gospel. The original word for Gospel is the Greek word Evangelion, which means glad tidings or good news. The sacred books gathered together into one book are called the Bible. This is from this is from uh, this is from Greek word which uh, this is from the a Greek word which means book. Chapter three, the attributes of God. God revealed to us concerning himself that he is a, sorry, by the way, if anyone has a question or they want to jump in, then please, please jump in. I'm just going to try and, I'm just going to try and read this through. But if you do want to ask a question or if you didn't hear something or if you didn't understand something, then please um, speak up. God revealed to us concerning himself that he is a bodiless and invisible spirit. John chapter four, verse 24. 
What does it mean that God has neither a body nor bones as we have, and does not have in himself anything that makes up our visible world, and therefore we cannot see him? In order to explain this, let us take an example from our earthly world. We do not see the air, but we see its actions and results. The movement of the air has great power which can move, move huge ships and complex machines. We feel and we know that we cannot live without the air that we breathe. So also we do not see God, but we see his activity and its results. His wisdom and power are everywhere in the world, and we feel them in ourselves. The invisible God, out of love for us, at various times appeared to righteous people in a visible form, in images or reflections of himself, that is to say, in such a form that they could behold him. Otherwise, they would have perished from directly beholding his majesty and glory. God said to Moses, There shall no man see me and live. If the sun, if the sun, blinds, us with it, sorry, if the sun blinds us with its brilliance, and we cannot look upon this, cre the, this creation of God lest we be blinded, then how much more so on God who created it? For God is light, and in him is no darkness at all, and he dwells in unapproachable light. God is eternal. All that we see in the world began at one time or another. It was born, and at some time it will also come to an end. It will die. It will be destroyed. All that is in the world is temporal. Everything has its beginning and its end. Once there was no heaven, there was no earth, no time, but there was God, because he has no beginning. Having no beginning, he has no end. God always was and always shall be. God is outside time. God always is. Therefore, he is called eternal. God is unchanging. There is nothing in the world constant or unchanging. Everything constantly changes, grows, ages and disintegrates. One thing is replaced by another. Only God is constant. There is no change in him. He does not grow, does not age. He in no way and on no account and at no time ever changes. Just as he always was, so he is now, and so he shall remain forever. God is always the same. Therefore he is called unchanging. God is omnipotent. If a man wants to make something, he needs material. Without material, he cannot make anything. With paint and canvas, man can paint a beautiful picture. From metal, he can make a complex and useful machine. But he can never make, for instance, the earth on which we live, or the sun which gives light and warmth, and many other things. Only for God is everything possible. There is nothing that he cannot do. He wished to create the world, and he created it out of nothing by his word alone. God can do all that he wishes. Therefore, he is called omnipotent. God is omnipresent. God always, throughout all time, is present everywhere. There is no place in the world where he is not present. No one can hide from him anywhere. God is everywhere. Therefore, he is called omnipresent. God is omniscient. Man can learn many things, know a great deal, but no man can know everything. Moreover, man cannot know the future and cannot hear everything and see everything. Only God alone knows everything, what was, what is, and what will be. For God, there is no difference between day and night. He sees and hears everything at all times. He knows each of us, and not only what we do and say, but also what we think and what we want. God always hears everything, sees everything, and knows everything. Therefore, he is called omniscient, meaning knowing all things. God is all good. People are not always good. It often happens that a person does not love someone else. Only God loves all of us and loves us perfectly, not as man loves. He gives all that we need for life. All that we see in the heavens and on the earth was created by the Lord for the good and benefit of man. This is how one bishop teaches about God's love for us. Quote, Who gave us life? 
the Lord. From him we from him we received a rational soul that can think and learn. From him we received a heart that is able to love. Around us is the around us is the air without which we cannot live. We are always supplied with water which is necessary as which is as necessary for us as the air. We live on the earth which supplies us all the food that is necessary for the maintenance and preservation of our life. We are supplied with light without which we could not do anything for ourselves. We have fire with which we can keep ourselves warm when, when it is cold and with which we can prepare the food we eat. All this is the gift of God. We have a father, mother, brothers, sisters and friends. How much joy, help and consolation they provide for us. But we would not have any of these were it not pleasing to the Lord to give them to us. End quote. God is always prepared to give us everything that is beneficial to us, everything good, and he takes more care for us than the best father does for his children. Therefore, God is called all good or most merciful. We call God our heavenly father. God is all righteous. Men often tell lies and are unjust, but God is perfectly just. He always preserves righteousness and he judges people justly. He does not punish a righteous man without a reason and he does not leave a man unpunished for any evil deed unless the man himself corrects his life by repentance and good deeds. Therefore God, God is called all righteous and all just. God is all sufficient. Man is always in need of something, therefore he is often dissatisfied. God alone has everything and is not in need of anything for himself. On the contrary, he gives everything to all. Therefore, he is called all-sufficient. God is all-blessed. God is not only all-sufficient, but he always has within himself the very highest joy, complete blessedness, the very greatest happiness. Therefore, God is called all-blessed. We can never find true joy in life except in God alone. We call God creator or maker because he created all things visible and invisible. We likewise, we likewise call God almighty, master and king because he, by his almighty will, rules and reigns and directs all that was created by him, holding them in his, in his power and authority. We call God divine provider because he provides for all things and takes care of all things. Chapter 4. Prayer God loves his creation. He loves each of us. And I will be a father unto you, and ye shall be my sons and daughters, saith the Lord Almighty. 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 18. Therefore we can always at any time turn to God, to our Heavenly Father, as if to our, as if to our own father or mother, our turning to God, and our turning to God is prayer. This means that prayer is conversation or speaking with God. It is as necessary for us as air and food. Everything we have is from God. We have nothing of our own. Life, abilities, health, food, all these things are given to us by God. Therefore, in times of both joy and sadness, whenever we need anything, we must turn to God in prayer, for the Lord is extremely good and merciful to us. If we ask from a pure heart, with faith and fervor concerning our needs, he will unfailingly fulfill our wish and grant all we need. We must completely rely on his holy will and patiently wait, for God alone knows what we need and, where and when to give it to us, what is useful and what is harmful. People who are slothful about sorry, people who are slothful about praying to God do great harm to their souls, for as they depart from God, God departs from them. Without prayer, man ceases to love God, he forgets about him, and he does not fulfill his purpose on earth, he sins. Chapter five Sin Sin or evil is a violation of God's law. Transgression or sin is violating the will of God. How did people begin to sin, and who was the first to violate the will of God? Before the creation of the visible world and man, God created angels. 
Angels are bodiless spirits, invisible and immortal. All the angels were created good, and God gave them complete freedom to love God or not, and to live with God or without God. One of the most radiant and powerful angels did not wish to love God, to depend on him, and to fulfill the will of God, but desired to become like God himself, to live independently. This angel ceased to obey God and began to resist God in everything. Thus he became the enemy of God, and many other angels went with him. For such a rebellion against God, these angels were all deprived of, deprived of the light and blessedness that had been given to them, and they became evil dark spirits. All these dark evil spirits are now called demons or devils. The main devil who was once the most radiant of the angels is called Satan, the enemy of God. The devil inspires people not to obey God, but to sin. The devil deceives. By cleverness and deceit, he taught the first people created by God, Adam and Eve, to violate the will of God. All people come from Adam and Eve, who first fell into sin, and therefore we are born with an inclination to sin. Being constantly, being constantly committed from generation to generation, sin has taken power over all men and has submitted everyone to itself. All men, to a greater or lesser degree, are sinners. It is sin that constantly separates man from God and leads to suffering, illness and death, temporal and eternal. It is for this reason that mankind began to suffer and die. Men alone, by their own efforts, could not overcome the evil that had spread throughout the world or destroy death. God in his compassion gave help to men, sending to earth his Son, our Saviour, Jesus Christ. Chapter 6. The Sign of the Cross we call ourselves Christians because we believe in God as we were taught to believe by the Son of God himself, our Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ not only taught us to believe in God correctly, but he also saved us from the power of sin and eternal death. The Son of God, Jesus Christ, out of love for us sinners, came down from heaven and as a man suffered instead of us for our sins. He was crucified, he died on the cross, and on the third day he resurrected. As the sinless Son of God, by his cross, that is, by suffering and death on the cross for the sins of all men and of all the world, he conquered not only sin, but also death itself. He arose from the dead, and he made the cross the weapon of his victory over sin and death. As the vanquisher of death, who arose on the third day, he saved us also from eternal death. He will resurrect all of us, all the dead, when the last day of the world comes. He will resurrect for us, sorry, he will resurrect us for joyful eternal life with God. The cross is the weapon or the sign of Christ's victory over sin and death. One teacher gives the following example in order to explain to his students how Jesus Christ could conquer evil in the world by his cross. For many years the Swiss fought against their enemies, the Austrians. Finally, the opposing armies met in a certain valley for a decisive battle. The Austrian soldiers, wearing their armour, were drawn up in battle array with their lances extended forward, and the Swiss, beating them with their maces, heavy, which are heavy clubs with weights on the end, tried without success to break the ranks of the enemy. Several times the Swiss threw themselves on the enemy with blind courage, but every time they were thrown back. They were not strong enough to break through the thick row of lances. Then one of the Swiss soldiers, Arnold Winkleried, sacrificed himself, ran ahead, grabbed with, both, uh, but grabbed with both arms several of the spears pointed at him, and allowed them to pierce his chest. In this way, an opening was made for the Swiss, and they broke into the ranks of the Austrians and won a decisive and final victory over their enemies. So the hero, Winkleried, sacrificed his own life and died, but he made it possible for his people to conquer the enemy. In the same way, our Lord Jesus Christ received in his breast the terrible spears of sin and death which were invincible for us. He died on the cross, but he also arose as the vanquisher of sin and death, and thus opened for us the way to eternal victory over evil and death. That is, he opened the way to eternal life. Now everything depends on us. If we wish to be delivered from the power of evil, sin, and eternal death, 
then we must follow Christ, that is, believe in Christ, love him, and fulfill his holy will, being obedient to him in everything, live with Christ. This is why, in order to express our faith in Jesus Christ our Saviour, we wear a cross in our body, and during prayer we form the cross over ourselves with our right hand, or make the sign of the cross. For the sign of the cross we put the fingers of our right hand together as follows. We bring the tips of the first three fingers together, the thumb, index and middle ones, and bend the last two, the ring and little fingers, against the palm. The first three fingers together express our faith in God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit, as the Trinity one in essence and indivisible. And the two fingers bent show how the Son of God, when he came down from heaven, being God, became man. That is, they signify his two natures, divine and human. In order to make the sign of the cross, with our fingers in this position, we touch our forehead for the blessing of our mind, our stomach for the blessing of our internal feelings, then our right and our left sh shoulders for the blessing of our bodily strength. The sign of the cross gives us great strength to repel and conquer evil and to do good, but we must remember to make the sign of the cross correctly and without haste, otherwise it will not be the sign of the cross, the cross but just waving our hand around, which only gladdens the demons. By making the sign of the cross carefully, we show a lack of reverence. Oh, sorry, by making the sign of the cross carelessly, we show a lack of reverence for God. This is a sin. This sin is called sacrilege. We make the sign of the cross or cross ourselves at the beginning of prayer, during prayer, at the end of prayer, and when we draw near to anything holy, when we enter the church, when we reverence the cross or an icon. We should cross ourselves at every important moment in our life, in danger, in sorrow, in joy, and so on. When we cross ourselves, mentally we say, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Thus we express our faith in the all-holy trinity and our desire to live and labour for the glory of God. The word Amin means in truth, truly, let it be so, so be it. We're resuming the law of God by Father Seraphim Slavodskoy, and this is part one, chapter seven. And the, cha the chapter is called Standing and Bows During Prayer. In order to express to God our reverence before him and our worship of him, during prayer we stand and do not sit. Only the sick and elderly are allowed to pray sitting down. Standing while at prayer is an ancient and God-ordained tradition. In Old Testament times, the congregation of Israel stood in the temple. The saints stand in heaven before the throne of God, and even Jesus Christ himself said, When ye stand praying, in Mark chapter 9, verse 25. Therefore Christians, according to apostolic teaching, stand through the divine services, where it is often proclaimed, Let us stand aright. In recognizing our sinfulness and unworthiness before God, and as a sign of our humility, we make bows during our prayers. There are bows from the waist when we, uh, okay. There are bows from the waist when we bow from the waist and to the ground, when we bow down on our knees and touch our head to the ground, which is called a prostration. Different types of prayer. If we and those close to us are healthy and safe. If we have a place to live, clothes to wear, food to eat, then we ought to give praise and give thanks to God in our prayers. Such prayers are called praise and thanksgiving. If some kind of misfortune, sickness or woe happens, or if we need something, then we must ask for God's help. These prayers are called petitions. If we do something wrong, if we do something wrong, sin, and we are guilty before God, then we must ask his forgiveness, repent. These, call, these, sorry, these prayers are called penitential. Since we are sinful before God, we constantly sin. We must always, before we ask God for anything, first repent and then ask God concerning our needs. This means that penitential prayer must always precede our petitions in prayer. When God hears our prayer. When we prepare to pray, 
we must first make peace with everyone to whom we have done evil and even with those who have who have and even with those who have anything against us and after that with reverence and attention stand for prayer during prayer we must direct our mind so that it does not think about anything else so that our heart wishes only one thing to pray better and please god if we pray without making peace with our neighbors if we pray hurriedly if we talk or laugh during prayer then our prayer will not be pleasing to god god will not hear such a prayer and he might even punish us for more diligent and intense prayer and for a good pious life fasting has been established the time of fasting or lent is the period when we must think more about god about our sins before god when we and when we must pray more repent not get upset or hurt anyone but rather help everyone read god's law and so on and to make it easier to fulfill all this we must first of all eat less not eat any meat eggs or milk that is animal and dairy products but eat only lenten food that is from plants bread vegetables fruit and fish if allowed we fast because the rich foods from animal and dairy products call forth a desire not to pray but to sleep or to act foolishly when we develop the habit of not giving in to our desires for more or rich foods it makes it easier to fight against sin the greatest and longest fast comes before pascha it is called great lent i have a question on this desvelta um before it says before we pray we must first make peace with everyone that we've done evil to and and even with those who have something against us so i guess someone could have something against us when that we haven't done evil to but i'm wondering um for for people in the world um they might have people who have things against them who are outside of the church um or they might not be they might not be at peace with someone outside of the church um does the same apply to people outside of the church as inside the church when it comes to praying like do we need should we make peace with these people even if they're not christians before we pray we make peace with anyone and everyone whether inside the church or not inside the church unless we um we don't have peace and it's not actually peace um for matters of the faith then that's okay not only okay but it's laudable um to have differences with people and to even come into um controversy with people who have a different set of beliefs than us so many times we'll be in order to support the truth uh we'll have to hurt the sensitivities of someone else yeah i have a question this but uh, and i'm just thinking if someone is say doing wrong by us maybe gossiping about us or um slandering us or something like that how is it possible to or how can we make peace with that person um before praying or should we even try if 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 it's been shown that we have we might have tried but it it, it isn't succeeding um, what do we do in that situation i wouldn't really worry about um someone that we've made attempts to have peace with uh sometimes that that kind of peace is is not meant to be it may not be from god so we should just have a clear heart that we've uh tried to be at peace with all people and knowing that we can never win over all people to to our set of beliefs or to to our heart then we just carry on thank you guys but uh can I ask something else please well <laughs> while I have the floor here um when um when it says that we should not laugh obviously that makes sense or talk during prayer now what sort of talk is that that is obviously not talk directed at god because sometimes we talk to him in in simple terms about you know what what's going on with us in our own words 
as well as the normal prayers, but is this meaning to talk to, as in having a conversation or being distracted by somebody else? Is that what this means? Uh, that's what I would interpret it as because, um, as you know, a lot of people uh, spend their time in church uh, looking for someone to chat with inside the church. So I think that's what's meant by that. I don't know. I'm just curious. Maybe your grace doesn't have any thoughts, but I was wondering, we, we just read about why we don't eat animal products when we're fasting. Um, did your grace have anything to say about that? The heavier the food, the more our mind is, is has problems listening to the truth and attaching itself to the truth. Fasting is also obedience. Uh, we have to remember that the first sin of Adam and Eve was not to fast and to disobey God. In other words, God said, do not eat of the, the tree of knowledge of good and bad, uh, for you will die. And they went ahead and ate of that tree. So it, they had disobedience and not controlling um, what they were eating, the two things we're talking about. So we're going to go ahead and this, so this next chapter is chapter 10, where and how we can pray to God. We can pray to God everywhere because God is everywhere, at home, in church, on every path. The Christian must pray every day, morning and evening, before and after eating, before and after every kind of work. This kind of prayer is called prayer at home or private prayer. On Sundays and holy days, and also on weekdays when we are free from work, we should go to church where other Christians like us gather. There we all pray together. This kind of prayer is called public prayer or prayer in church. The church building. The church or temple is a special house consecrated to God, the house of God, in which the divine services are conducted. In the church there abides the special grace or mercy of God, which is given to us through those who conduct the divine services, namely the, cl the clergy, bishops, priests, and deacons. The external appearance of the church differs from other buildings in that there is a dome which symbolizes heaven rising over the church. At the top of the dome is its peak where the cross stands to the glory of the head, Jesus Christ. Over the entrance to the church, there is usually built a bell tower where the bells are hung. The ringing of the bells serves to summon the faithful to prayer, to the divine services, and to give notice of the most important parts of the service taking place in the church. At the entrance to the church, there is a porch, a courtyard or, a courtyard or entranceway. The inside of the church is divided into three parts. One, the narthex. Two, the church itself or the nave or middle, middle part of the church where the people stand. Three, the altar or sanctuary where the services are conducted by the clergy and where the most important part of the whole church is located, the holy table, otherwise known as the altar table, on which the mystery of the Holy Eucharist is celebrated. The altar is separated from the central part of the church by the oconostasis, which consists of several rows of icons and has three doors. The central doors are called the royal doors because through them the Lord Jesus Christ himself, the King of glory, passes invisibly in the holy gifts in holy communion. Therefore, no one may pass through the royal doors except the clergy. The reading and chanting of prayers that are served in the church by the clergy are called divine services. The most important divine service is the liturgy. It is conducted before noonday. During this service, the entire earthly life of the Saviour is commemorated and the mystery of the Eucharist, otherwise known as Holy Communion, which Christ himself instituted at the mystical supper, is celebrated. The mystery of Holy Communion is the consecration of bread and wine by God's grace when they become the true body and true blood of Christ. In appearance, they remain bread and wine, but we receive the true body and true blood of the Saviour under the appearance of bread and wine in order to enter the kingdom of heaven, have eternal life, and change ourselves. Since the church is a very holy place where God himself is present invisibly by special mercy, we must enter it with prayer and conduct ourselves quietly and reverently. 
During the divine services, it is forbidden to talk and even more so to laugh. It is forbidden to stand with your back to the altar. Each person stands in his place and does not walk from one place to another. Only in case of sickness is it permitted to sit down and rest. It is wrong to leave the church before the end of the divine service. We must approach Holy Communion calmly and without haste, with our arms crossed over our breast. After Communion, we kiss the chalice without making the sign of the cross in order not to strike the chalice accidentally. Okay, the next chapter is chapter 12, The Priest's Blessing. The clergy, that is, specially ordained people who celebrate the divine services, are our spiritual fathers. Bishops and priests sign us with the sign of the cross. This is called a blessing. When the priest blesses us, he forms the Greek letters ICXC, that is, Jesus Christ, uh, Jesus Christ with the fingers of his hand. This means that through the priest, our Lord Jesus Christ himself blesses us. Therefore, we must receive the blessing of the clergy with reverence. When we hear in church the words of blessing, peace unto all and others, in reply to them, we should bow without making the sign of the cross. In order to receive a personal blessing from a bishop or a priest, we should place our hands in the form of a cross, the right hand on the left with the palms upward. I'll say that again because I have pictures here, but you, everyone's listening. So um, we should place our hands in the form of a cross, the right hand on the left with the palms upward. When we have received the blessing, we kiss the hand that blesses us. We kiss, as it were, the invisible hand of Christ the Saviour himself. Chapter 13, Icons. In the church on the iconostasis, along the walls and at home in the corners are the holy icons, before which we say our prayers. An icon or image is what we call the representation of God himself, the mother of God, the angels or the saints. This representation is consecrated with holy water and prayer. Through this blessing, through this blessing, the grace of the Holy Spirit is imparted to the icon, and we reverence the icon as being holy. There are icons through which the grace of God that abides in them is revealed even by miracles, for instance, in the healing of the sick. The Saviour himself gave us his portrait. Moved to compassion, he wiped his sacred face with a towel and miraculously, miraculously depicted his face on this towel for the sick prince Abgar. When the sick prince prayed before the icon of the Saviour that, that had not been made with hands, he was healed of his illness. When praying before an icon, we must remember that the icon is not God himself or a saint of God, but only the depiction of God or his saint. Therefore, we must not pray to the icon, but to God or the saint who is depicted on it. The holy icon is a sacred book. In a sacred book, we reverently read the words of God, and on a holy icon, we reverently behold the holy faces which, like the word of God, lift up our mind to God and his saints and inflame our heart with love for our creator and saviour. How God is portrayed in the holy icons. God is an invisible spirit. However, he appeared to holy men in a visible image. Therefore, we depict God in the icons in the form in which he appeared. We depict the most holy trinity in the form of three angels sitting at a table. This is because the Lord once appeared to Abraham in the form of three angels. In order to represent more clearly the spirituality of the angels that appeared to Abraham, we represent them with wings. God the Son is presented in the form in which he appeared when he came down from heaven for our salvation and became man, an infant in the arms of the mother of God, teaching the people and working miracles, transfigured, suffering on the cross, lying in the tomb, resurrecting and ascending. God the Holy Spirit is repre represented in the form of a dove as he revealed himself at the time of the baptism of the Saviour in the Jordan by John the Baptist and in the form of tongues of fire as he descended visibly upon the, upon the holy apostles on the 50th day after the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Others besides God who were depicted in the holy icons. 
Besides God, we depict in the holy icons the Mother of God, the holy angels, and holy people. We should pray to them not as to God, but as being close to God, as having pleased him by their holy life. Out of love for us, they pray for us before God, and we should ask for their help and intercession because the Lord for their sake will more speedily hear our sinful prayers. It is worthy of note that the first icons of the Mother of God painted by the disciple of the Lord, St. Luke, have been preserved down to our time. There is a tradition that when the Mother of God saw her portrait, she said, The grace of my son will dwell with this icon. We pray to the Mother of God because she is closest of all to God, and at the same time, she is also close to us. Because of her motherly love and her prayers, God forgives us many things and helps us in many ways. She is a great and compassionate, in, compassionate intercessor for all of us. The Holy Angels In the beginning when neither the world nor men yet, yet existed, God created the Holy Angels. Angels are bodiless spirits, therefore invisible and immortal. The Lord God granted to them loftier powers and abilities than to mankind. Their mind is more perfect than ours. They always fulfill the will of God. They are without sin, and now they are so filled with the grace of God in doing good that they do not desire in any way to sin. Many times the angels have appeared in visible form, taking on a physical appearance, when God sent them to people to relate or to announce his will. The word angel means messenger. Every Christian is granted by God at his baptism a guardian angel who invisibly protects him during all his earthly life from misfortunes and dangers. He warns against sin, guards us at the terrible hour of death, and does not depart after death. The angels are depicted in icons in the form of handsome youths as a sign of their spiritual beauty. Their wings show that they speedily fulfill the will of God. About the Saints on the icons also we represent holy people or the saints of God. We call them by this name because when they lived on earth, they pleased God by their righteous life. And now, dwelling, dwelling in heaven with God, they pray for us to God and help us who live on earth. The saints have different titles. Prophets, apostles, martyrs, hierarchs, holy monks, unmercenaries, blessed ones, and the righteous. The prophets are the saints of God who, by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, foretold the future, primarily about the Saviour. They lived before the coming of the Saviour. The apostles were the closest disciples of Jesus Christ, whom he sent during his earthly life to preach. After the coming of the Holy Spirit upon them, they preached the Christian faith in all lands. At first there were twelve of them, and later seventy more. Two of the apostles, Peter and Paul, are called leaders of the apostles because they laboured in preaching the faith of Christ more than the others. Four of the apostles, Matthew, Mark, Luke and John the theologian, who wrote the Gospels, are called evangelists. Saints who spread the Christian faith in various places like the apostles are called equal to the apostles, as for example, Mary Magdalene, the first woman Martha Thecla, the pious monarchs Constantine and Helen, the pious Russian Prince Vladimir, Saint Nina, the Enlightener of Georgia, and others. The martyrs are those Christians who accepted terrible tortures and even death for their faith in Jesus Christ. If they died in peace, that is, not as an, not as an immediate result of their sufferings for Christ, then we call them confessors. The first to suffer for the holy faith after especially terrible sufferings for faith in Christ were Archdeacon Stephen and Saint Thecla, and therefore they are called the first martyrs. Those who died for the holy faith are especially, uh, after especially cruel tortures, such as not all the martyrs were subjected to, are called great martyrs. As for example, holy great martyr George, and the holy great martyrs Barbara and Catherine. The confessors on whose faces the persecutors branded or tattooed blasphemous words are called branded. Hierarchs are bishops and prelates who pleased God by a righteous life, such as St. Nicholas the Wonder Worker, St. Alexis Metropolitan of Moscow, and others. Hierarchs and priests who suffered persecution for Christ are called hero martyrs. 
The hierarchs Basil the Great, Gregory the Theologian, and John Chrysostom are called ecumenical teachers, teachers of the, of the entire Christian church. Holy monks and nuns are righteous people who abandon the life of the world and society and please God by preserving their virginity, not entering into marriage, by fast and also by fasting and prayer and dwelling in the wilderness or in monasteries. Some examples are Sergius of Radanez, Seraphim of Sarov, Saint Anastasia, and others. Holy monks that endured suffering for Christ are called monk martyrs. Unmercenaries are saints who serve their neighbors with the unmercenary healing of illnesses. That is, without payment, they without payment they healed illnesses, both physical and spiritual. They include Cosmas and Damien, the great martyr and healer Pantalemon, and others. The righteous, led a, as in the title righteous, the righteous led a righteous life that was pleasing to God, living as we do in the world with a family, as for example, Joachim and Anna and others. The first righteous people on the earth were the patriarchs of the human race who were called forefathers. They include Adam, Noah and Abraham. About halos on the icons. Around the heads of the Saviour, the Mother of God, and the Holy Saints of God, in the icons and pictures of them there is depicted a radiance or a circle of light which is called a halo. In the halo of the Saviour there are three letters, O, Omega, and N, which translated from Greek into English means being or he who is, for God alone always exists. Over the head of the Mother of God are placed the letters MP and Theta V. I'm saying these in English, but uh, me, Uro, Theta uh, V. What's, what's, um, I don't know what uppercase V is. Sorry, that last letter is uh, a cross between its two letters combined into one uh, Omicron and Ypsilon, which would come out to U, meter okay. per U. Mother of God. Okay, so it's so in English let us say it's O and U together. It's a combination. Thank you, Despotel. I'll go back. So over the head of the Mother of God are placed the letters M P and the Greek the Greek letter theta and V, which Yarada just said is a combination of O and U. These are the first and last letters of the Greek words which means which mean Mary, Mother of God. A halo is the depiction of the shining of light and glory of God which transfigure a man who is united with God. This invisible shining of the light of God in the saints sometimes becomes visible for people around them. Thus, for example, the holy prophet Moses had to hide his face with a veil so that people would not be blinded by the light that proceeded from his face. Also, the face of Saint Seraphim of Sorov shone, shone like the sun during his talk with Nicholas Motovilov about the acquisition of the Holy Spirit. Motovilov himself wrote that it was not possible for him to look at the face of Saint Seraphim. Thus, the Lord glorified his holy saints, who shine with the light of his glory even here on earth. Why we call ourselves Orthodox Christians. We call ourselves Orthodox Christians because we believe in our Lord Jesus Christ as exactly as is written in the Creed and belong to the one holy Catholic and Apostolic Church that was founded by the Saviour himself on earth and which is directed by the Holy Spirit in preserving correctly, gloriously and without change the teaching of Jesus Christ. That is, we belong to the Orthodox Christian Church. All the other Christians who confess a faith in Christ, which is not the same as the Orthodox Church, do not belong to her and are called the non-Orthodox or heterodox. This includes Catholics, otherwise known as Roman Catholics, and Protestants, such as Lutherans, Baptists, and sectarians. Um, the word sect is used by the Apostle Paul in one of his epistles, at least. Um, what is what is the orthodox definition for sect because i know heresy and schism but i don't know sect i say that in its simplest meaning sect is a division so um, a sect would be anything that um is cut off from the church it's a division it's not the full 
um, the unity of the church. And so it's something that's certainly not desirable to be a sect of any kind. In today's um, wording of things, uh, sex would be something very dangerous, something very strange, but it's in its simple meaning, it's not that. It's anything that's cut off from the body of the church. Um, I'm just interested in that Father Seraphim here referred to other people who are not Orthodox as Christians. And my understanding previously was that we didn't really refer to them as Christians if they were not in the true church. But he is referring to them as Christians because of their faith in Christ, even though they're not in the true church. So, um, this, but what is the actual, what, what is our actual stand on this? There are two ways we, we use the term Christians. We can use it very generally to speak to people that acknowledge Christ as uh, their savior. But if we look at uh, the fathers, we see that someone that is outside the church is not even a Christian because uh, they cannot bear the name of Christ when they don't belong to the church. Uh, so in one case, um, Brother Seraphim can use the term very usually, and we all do it, that uh, at least he was uh, a Christian and, and not a pagan. Um, but again, that's a general use of the term. Uh, but in specifics, we call Christian anyone who's an Orthodox Christian uh, truly living the life in Orthodoxy. So Father Seraphim's book, the, the next section is is called is all about prayers and it gives explanations on oh, I'm cutting in and out. It gives explanations on the different prayers that we use in the Orthodox Church, both in services and prayers that you have in your prayer books. It's a very, very useful section, and if anyone has the book, I do recommend reading this, but like privately. We're not going to read it here because it's just it wouldn't it wouldn't read very well in a group. But I do thoroughly recommend this section for anyone who wants to to learn more about the prayers that we use and and what the meaning of them, the meaning of those prayers are. We're going to read right at the very end of the the history of the Old Testament about the the Greek Empire and the translation of the Old Testament into Greek. Um, so this is this this is chapter 42 of the Old Testament history and it's called the Greek Empire the translation of the books of the Old Testament into the Greek language. For a long time, about 200 years, the Median Persian Empire continued. The Jews, upon returning from captivity in Babylon, remained under the power of the Persian king. Then the Persian kingdom was conquered by the, great, by the Greek king Alexander the Great, king of Macedonia, who was also sovereign over Egypt and Syria. Alexander the Great, the most powerful king of his time, respected the holy temple of Jerusalem, and throughout his life he was especially protective of the Hebrew people. After his death, the kingdom disintegrated, and it fell to four of his military chiefs. One of these, Ptolemy, having become king of Egypt, subjugated the Hebrews and brought many thousands of Jews to Egypt. Under his son, son King Ptolemy II Philadelphus, who was kindly disposed to the Jews, a magnificent work was done. By his command, the books of the Old Testament were translated from the Hebrew language into Greek. Translation was made by 70 interpreters, that is, scholars. Greek was the most commonly used language of that time. This translation was of enormous benefit, for it enabled even the pagans to read the holy scriptures in a language known to them. In this way, the empire of the Greek king served to spread the truth about God among the heathens. For about a hundred years, the Jews were under the power of the Greek kings reigning in Egypt. However, the Greek kings reigning in Syria did not treat the Hebrews and the faith in the true in the, and the faith in the true God in the manner that the Egyptian kings did. The Jews endured much sorrow. The Syrian kings began to persecute them for the true faith and to force them into idolatry. An especially brutal oppressor was the king Antiochus Epiphanes, martyrs for the faith, the Maccabees. King Antiochus King Antiochus Ep Epiphanes wanted 
all of his subjects to speak the same language, Greek, and to worship only Greek gods, that is, idols. Many of the Jews obeyed the king, but there were others who were ready to die rather than to forsake the true faith. The royal rulers tried to force the elder Eleazar to eat food forbidden by the law of Moses, pork. When he refused, they tried to persuade him to bring his own meat, such as was lawful for him to use, and to pretend that he ate the flesh taken of the sacrifice commanded by the king. To this he answered, It is not becoming at my age to be a hypocrite. If young people find out that Eleazar, being fourscore and ten years old, has now gone to a strange religion, then they may be tempted to desert the faith. Then they turned him over to the torturers, and Eleazar died courageously for the faith. Once the woman Solomonia and her seven sons were brought before the king himself. The king compelled them to eat pork, but they boldly replied, We are ready to die rather than to then to transgress the law of our fathers. Then the king handed them over to brutal torture. They cut out their tongues, cut off their fingers and toes, pulled the skin of pulled the skin off their heads, and burned them alive in hot frying pans. Thus six of the brothers were martyred. The king tenderly tried to convince the youngest not to oppose him. He assured him with oaths that he would reward would reward him and finally turned to his mother to counsel her son to save his life. But she bowed herself toward him and said, O my son, fear not this tormentor, but being worthy of thy brethren, accept death, that I may receive thee again in the future eternal life. The king then turned the youngest son over to death by torture harsher than all the rest. Last of all, after the sons, the mother died. This family of martyrs is known as the Maccabean martyrs. In defense of the true faith and their homeland, there arose a priest, Mattathias, with his five sons. Many zealots of the law of God soon gathered around them. One of the sons of Mattathias was especially distinguished for bravery, Judas, Judas Maccabeus, named for the, named for the Maccabean martyrs. Judas Maccabeus won many victories over the Syrians with only a small group of soldiers. But once, he was surrounded by a large army of Syrians, 22,000 troops, and he, ha and he had only 800 men. Judas died the death of a hero. He would not consent to flee from his enemy and thereby darken his glory. His brother Simon finally defeated the Syrian army, and having rid the city of Jerusalem of them, purified the temple, and freed his people from the power of the Greek kings. In gratitude for this, the Jews established that from that time until the advent of the Saviour, the eldest of the family of Simon would be the chief priest and ruler of the people. Um, so this is obviously referencing heavily, this is referring to the book of Maccabees in the Septuagint, the Old Testament, the, the Orthodox Old Testament. So it says here in the translator's note, in the, King's James, in the King James Version, these books are found in what's called the Apocrypha of the Old Testament. And the King James Version does not include the story of Simon. Chapter 43, the Roman Empire and the universal expectation of the Messiah. Having been freed from the empire of the Greek kings, the Jews did not have long to make use of their freedom. The Romans, having conquered the whole known world, also subjugated the Jews in 64 BC. They placed over Palestine the procurator Antipater from the tribe of Esau, an Idumean or Edomite. He very cleverly secured the confidence of the Romans, but was soon poisoned. After him, his son Herod, called Herod the Great, was appointed governor of Galilee. He was a suspicious, brutal and cunning man. He also, like his father, skillfully gained the confidence of the Roman authorities and was declared king of the Jews. In order to find favour among the Jews, King Herod restored the Jerusalem temple. Having received the title of king, he was still subordinate to Caesar, the Roman emperor. From the time that the Jews came under Roman power, they were always subject to a Roman ruler, a deputy of the Roman emperor. The Jews were allowed to keep their Sanhedrin, that is, their council of high priests and elders of the people, but the power of the Sanhedrin was strictly limited. The Sanhedrin, for example, could not impose the death penalty without the permission of the Roman ruler, to whom belonged the highest authority in Israel. 
the worldwide control of the Roman Empire shook paganism to its foundations. Rome was the capital of the world, and there gathered the scholars, writers, merchants, and other representatives of all the nations. Each one brought with him his own pagan faith. These people, seeing the endless variety of pagan idol deities, became convinced that all these pagan gods were devised by the people themselves. Many of the pagans began to lose faith and hope in the future. In order to seek blissful oblivion, they began to indulge in every sort of amusement. Some, falling into despondency, ended their lives by suicide. But the best of them, observing that the world was headed toward destruction, nevertheless maintained the hope that from somewhere would come a saviour, if not from among the people, then from above. The Jews, dispersed throughout all the world after their captivity in Babylon and other later captivities, spread the news about the imminent coming of the saviour of the world. Therefore, the gaze of the best people in the pagan world began to turn to the east, to Palestine. Among the Romans and other pagan people, there arose the general belief that in the east there would soon appear a powerful king who would subjugate the entire world. In Palestine itself, among the Jews, the expectation of the Messiah was especially intense. Everyone felt that the time was coming for the fulfillment of the prophecies and the salvation of Israel. The prophecies of the prophet Daniel about the date of the appearance of Christ were especially precise. He foretold that after a period of 70 weeks of years came to an end, a fourth great kingdom would arise. This was an exact specification of the time of the advent of Christ. Even the semi-pagan Samarit semi Samaritans hoped that soon would come Christ the Saviour, who would resolve all the quarrelsome questions between them and the Jews concerning the faith. Unfortunately, not only the pagans, but also the Jews themselves mistakenly imagined what Christ would be like. They did not picture him as the prophet Isaiah and other prophets represented him, as one that would bear our sins, suffer for us, and though innocent, be condemned to death. The Jews had no idea that Christ the Saviour would come to earth for the purpose of teaching people through his example, of teaching people through his example, word, deeds, and suffering, to love God and each other. They desired to see Christ not like this, but rather with worldly power and glory. Therefore, they thought that Christ would come in worldly glory and would be the earthly king over the Jewish people. He would free the Jews from the power of Rome and would subjugate the whole world, and the Jews would reign over all the peoples of the earth. Only a few devout and righteous people awaited Christ with humility, faith, and love expected the true saviour of the world, who would come to deliver people from enslavement to sin and the power of the devil. He would trample on the head of the serpent, as God said to the first people in paradise, to save people from eternal death and to open the gates to the kingdom of heaven for eternal blessed life with God. When the time came, God gave the promised saviour of the world, his only begotten son, Jesus Christ. The son of God dwelt in the holy virgin Mary, and by the action of the Holy Spirit, received from her a human body and soul, that is, he was born from the most holy virgin Mary and became God incarnate. The birth of Jesus Christ occurred in the days when Herod the Great, the Edomite, reigned over the Jews in the time of the Roman Emperor Augustus. Palestine The land of Palestine, upon whose soil our Saviour lived, is comprised of a comparatively small strip of land, about 150 miles long, miles wide, situated along the eastern coast of the Mediterranean Sea. In the north of Palestine, on the slopes of Mount Lebanon, lies Galilee. Picturesque hills, green pastures, and gardens make Galilee the most beautiful part of Palestine. Its chief adornment is the Sea of Galilee, which is also known as the Lake of Gennesaret or Tiberias. It is more than 12 miles in length and a little more than 5 miles in width. At the time of the Saviour, the shores of this sea were covered with lush vegetation. Palm trees were growing there along with vineyards, fig trees, almond trees and flowering oleander. Beautiful cities, Capernaum, Tiberias, Chorazin and Bethsaida, situated on the banks of this sea, were not large but densely populated. The inhabitants led simple and industrious lives. They cultivated every plot of land and engaged in commerce and various trades the chief of which was fishing. 
To the south of Galilee lies Samaria. The inhabitants of Samaria, the Samaritans, were in constant conflict with the Jews. They even built themselves a separate temple on Mount Ger Gerizim in order to avoid going to Jerusalem. The largest part of Palestine, to the south of Samaria, is called Judea. The western part of it is level plain, interrupted by small streams flowing into the Mediterranean Sea. This sea gradually rises toward the east and is bordered by the Judean hills. From ancient times it was famous for its fertility. The slopes of the Judean hills are dressed in green, covered with whole groves of olive trees. More distant, more distant and higher mountains become rockier and more dismal. Among these hills is the great city of Jerusalem, the capital of Judea and of all Palestine. The largest river in Palestine is the Jordan. The Jordan begins mountains of Lebanon in the form of sparkling mountain streams. Downstream in the valley, these streams form a single river, which spills into and forms the Sea of Galilee. From this sea, the Jordan River flows out in the form of a fast, wide river with low green banks. At that time, this was called the Valley of the Jordan. Approaching Judea, the banks of the Jordan become higher and drier, composed of bare rocks devoid of any vegetation. Only the backwaters along the Jordan are thickly covered with reeds. There crocodiles swim and wild beasts hide. This was the Jordan Desert in which John the Baptist lived and preached. At the end of its course, the Jordan flows into a most wild and uninhabited country and empties into the Dead Sea. Now we call the land of Palestine the Holy Land since it was sanctified by the life of the Saviour. Um, getting a background on these things, like the, the, the details about Palestine and the vegetation, what life was like, how people made their living. Um, these things are, you know, interesting to me anyway to know because I, I didn't really know these things and it actually sounds, sounds as if it was very beautiful.